Hey, it's your boy, Little Freak, here to bring you Season 2 of Konosuba. When we last left off, Kazuma was under arrest for detonating a local lord's mansion with an unstable coronatite. The homies come in from the sidelines to defend his honor. They fail miserably and only end up quarreling. Kazuma's companions immediately throw him under the metaphorical giant mechanical spider, except Darkness. Wiz tries to take credit for the explosion, but is silenced by Aqua. And now, as a suspected member of the Demon King's army, with no allies to rally by his side, Kazuma is placed in confinement. A conspicuous explosion heralds the arrival of Aqua, who has come to break Kazuma out of the pokey. She gives him a hairpin, explains her plan, then falls. It's a combination lock. The following night, Aqua arrives again under the delicate cover of explosion magic. She brought a hacksaw this time around, and a box for Kalpumer to stand on, which predictably cannot fit through the bars. The next morning, he was in interrogated by the police, who are using a magical golden titty to detect lies. The nipple makes it difficult for him to answer the questions, due to the pathetic truth of his past. He at last passionately admits to saving the town. The titty is not afraid, causing the prosecutor to change her tone. Kazuma also changes his tone, by listing his achievements and riding on a horse so far into the heavens that Eris could potentially get more screen time. His opponent apologizes profusely, while Kazuma scrounges the seabed for more atonements. The prosecutor asks one last question, are you connected to the Demon King's army? He has connections to Wiz, so the answer is yes. Well, time to die. The homies have all prepared counters for the prosecution. Kazuma is reassured, yet understandably still worried. The villain, Aldarp, twirls his mustache menacingly. Chris is questioned about the public panty stealing, which is damning evidence. Kazuma is defeated. Mitsubishi is questioned about the graham cracker stealing, which is also damning evidence. Kazuma is defeated twice over. The hoes are questioned about the sexual harassment, which is, again, damning evidence. Kazuma is defeated a third time. Things are not looking good for our our protagonist. His deranged women have his back though. Megumin demands proper evidence, and each of the party members are promptly defeated. The golden nip-nop reveals sufficient evidence of subversion. Kazuma proclaims the absolute truth of his situation, pleasing the titty and finishing the case. Not so fast, Saibankan. Lord Aldope Dono has the last say. Darkness flexes her bureaucratic advantage over the filthy aristocrat by presenting her dustiness, family crest, to the attendees. Her secret is revealed to everyone. Aldauber is enraged. Darkness promises him a favor in exchange for Kazuma's life. Aldork is aroused. Kazuma is cheered on by the populace as the judge demands silence. Blondie is killed. Satao Kazuma is a free man once again, thanks to his valued allies. Sometime later, Darkness must leave to engage in political violence as the credits roll. The second chapter of his life in another world is just beginning, and all his personal assets are currently being seen by order of the court to pay back his debts. They even took Homie's tracksuit. The once warm and lively house is now coated in despair. Kazuma fears for Darkness's innocence at the hands of Aldor, or whatever is left of her innocence. Megumer found a cat. Megumin doesn't understand the severity of Darkness's debauchery when placed in such a socially crippling scenario. They collectively decide to console her upon her return. Suddenly, a request. The party must eliminate unseasonal gigafrogs, which have awoken early due to Megumin's frequent explosions slug in their style. Aqua distracts the frog by screaming in terror, while Megrometer is eaten whole, accepting her fate as an empty wizard. Kazuma unveils his snipe skill. He explains that it relies primarily on luck, making it a perfect fit for him. The frog is gracefully dispatched, or not, I guess. Aqua is goopy, Kazuma is droopy. More frogs arrive to avenge their cousin's demise. They flee and quarrel at the same time. The civil servant is tongued aggressively, and so too is Aqua. Megumin utters her last pleas for help as Kazuma evades his pursuers. The women make sensual noises. Kazuma faces his slippery doom. A busty little girl absolutely obliterates the pathetic amphibians with a giggle. She is thanked by Kazuma, revealing that Megumin is her longtime rival. Megumin pretends to not know her. The mystery Maiden introduces herself, Crimson Demon style, as Union, Archmage, and future leader of the Crimson Demons. She challenges Megumin to a duel. Union is rejected. Megumin caves to her rival's request and calls for a martial arts bout. Union reveals her gullibility while exposing Megumin's exploitative childhood mannerisms. They are clearly good friends, as Union's lunches kept Megumin alive. The old friends take their stances while Kazuma watches on. Megumin is at a disadvantage normally. She is slathered in frog grease and ready to party, however. Union is defeated. 
Back at town, Megumin attained an orb from her battle and presents it to Kazuma to sell. He flirts briefly but is deflected by Magoo's patented slime attack. Back at headquarters, Shamusuke is frightened by the goo goblins and the two quarrel over jurisdiction of the bathhouse. Kazuma asserts his dominance by stripping in front of Megumin. She responds by mimicry. Kazuma agrees that this solves their problem. Megumin is shook. Kazupa firmly lectures her about gender equality. She responds by attempting to flee. Kazuma insults her further, causing Megumin to violently strip him. Later, they're being homies in the bath while discussing union. They suddenly recall the societal implications of being in the same bath together as Aqua returns home. Kazuma dramatically freezes the bathroom's door shut from fear of being called a lollycon. He runs out of juice. Aqua becomes distracted. Kazuma is relieved, but Megumin has vengeance on her mind. She presumably beats Kazuma for calling her a lolly. The next day, Kazuma goes to sell the spoils of war to Wiz. It's Union in a silly quirk of fate. Megumin reveals that Toontoon is a weird crimson demon who feels embarrassment. She used to self-isolate from the the other children back at Hogwarts, and her only other friend was Megumin. Union makes a sad defense, ending the conversation early. Aqua finds something called a friendship crystal to solve the demon's duel. Wiz confirms that only seasonal magicians can activate the orb, and Megumin is challenged once more. They channel their gunk, making the crystal glow and project holographic monitors. It's a collage of embarrassing memories from both of their sad, pathetic childhoods. Megumin is eating various bugs to survive, while Yunyun resorts to satanic rituals to summon a friend. Megumin is sent into a frenzy from the friendship stone, immediately shattering it to pieces to end the misery. Wiz pins the orb on Kazuma's tab, while Union mopes in the corner. It would seem the duel was a draw, so they must now compare breast sizes. Megumin deflects by confessing that she and Kazuma bathed together. Union is defeated and sent crying out of the shop. Despite being suspected of domestic terrorism, Kazuma continues to accompany Megumin on her daily jaunt to unleash explosion magic indiscriminately on the wildlife. They bask in the beauty of it all. Later, the party laments their lack of cash. Kazuma suggests they go to a dungeon, but Megumin cannot use her magic within the confines of a labyrinth's hallways. The guild babe gave Kazuma some insider information on a recently discovered passageway in a place called Kiel's Dungeon. It's the perfect opportunity to scoop some easy treasure at the dungeon Thank you. The crew prepare for their spelunk. Kazuma enters first to scout the area with his newly acquired thief skills. He scours the dark passageways with his enhanced perception, capitalizing on his strengths. Aqua doesn't care because she is an all-powerful goddess of death. She may be able to see in the dark, but her clumsiness negates this positive. Aqua continues to haphazardly romp through the gloom. The motley pair eventually find their destined location, navigating down a staircase infested with monsters. An adventurer's corpse signals the correct path as Aqua frees the lingering spirit within. Kazuma carefully maps each room one by one to prevent their likely deaths. Aqua finds a suspicious treasure chest, but is stopped by Kazuma after he detects it to be a mimic. The two reflect on the brutality of the dungeon's ecosystem. Aqua breezes through the twisting corridors, dispelling swathes of undead with every step. Kazuma is thankful to have Aqua along, but is suspicious of the vast amounts of undead shuffling around down here. Aqua senses one remaining dead guy with her holy smeller, an illusory door reveals its proprietor, the evil wizard named Kiel, who built the dungeon to flee with the king's daughter. He has a flashback to the days of old, where Kiel admits to actually being a pretty good guy, who just wanted his beloved to be happy. After his monologue, Kiel requests that he be slain. Aqua prepares the magic circle, while Kazuma reflects on how Kiel is a cool guy, despite being a lich. Aqua does a godly ritual to purify him, sending the righteous dead to be greeted by Eris in the afterlife. Kiel is pleased. Kazuma loots the treasure, and they begin to head back. He ruminates over the mass quantities of undead, suggesting that Aqua may have been like catnip for them. This fact, of course, nullifies the need to keep Aqua close. She immediately becomes defensive, pleading to not be left behind, and ultimately attracting more monsters with her misery. Kazuma lurks into the gloom, leaving her to suffer the consequences of her actions. Later. Aqua is dramatized, but Kazuma is unrelenting in his wrath. After all is said and done, the party return to the guild with a hefty trove, which is immediately spent on booze. Union observes from the exterior. Aqua celebrates with her iconic party tricks, while Kazuma flirts with a guild woman. His brothel buddies mistake his intentions for offering free drinks, and the wealth he acquired goes towards the greater morale effort. Lastly, Kazuma drunkenly deprives Chris of her undergarments, inciting a succession of various sexual harassment cases. Kazuma is elated by this conclusion, beer ingested, panties in hand, money in the coffers, and a big, sloppy smile on his face. 
It would seem that the party is cold, hungry, and poor. Kazuma threatens Aqua with pawning her last bottle of pricey booze for attempting to incinerate his precious tracksuit. Kazuma steals Aqua's goddess scarf as a mysterious, well-dressed woman breasts boobily through the door. It's Darkness, who is aroused by not being recognized. Aqua finds safety from Kazuma's wrath in Darkness's bosom. Megumin consoles the noble woman in light of her assumed political deflowering. They all cry tears of reassurance, but miss the mark slightly. She unveils a picture of a handsome lad whose illustration is immediately torn in half from Kazuma's primal instincts. Darkness explains that Aldorp is attempting to arrange a marriage between her and his son. She begs the group to prevent the strategy from unfolding. Kazuma notes that preventing her marriage will secure their crusader's place in the party. He has second thoughts about helping after recalling Darkness's traits, once more tearing the portrait of Aldorp's progeny from thoughtless passion. Cusco explains the reasoning behind accepting her marriage as a ploy to sabotage the Lord. Darkness becomes excited at the thought of forever being unwed. Kazuma's parole officer shows up to recruit them for monster extermination. She is repelled by Megumin as Kazuma ideates. He decides that Megumin would only serve to hinder his plot to marry off Darkness and pleads her to handle the incursion, inspiring her with praise of her talents. Later at the mansion, Darkness introduces her friends to her dad and they get dressed up to fit the theme. At the destined meeting of the houses, Darkness goes feral, stating that she will destroy this meeting. Kazuma gently reprimands her as Sir Walther enters. Darkness's tirade is abruptly interrupted by Kazuma's countermeasures. After her prospective husband's arrival, Darkness confronts Kazuma about their plan. He responds by reminding her to not besmirch her family's name. Darkness remains determined to eventually be abused by the Devil King, stating that the charming and honorable figure that is Walter is not the type of man she desires. Kazuma most closely resembles her ideal, a slimy, perverse, angry wretch of a man who doesn't mind kicking a couple of babies to get his way. She goes on to describe the most horrible human being that she can think of as her ideal partner, followed by an expected lascivious spasm. At the introductions, Aldork's perfect spawn introduces himself formally as Alexi Barnes Walther. Darkness begins to insult Walter, but is given the reward of a light winter breeze on her nape. Lord Dusty takes his leave as the young nobles move to the gardens. Aqua can talk to fish now. Darkness tries to admit to hunting goblins for sport, but fails. She suddenly tears her pants off and then challenges Walter to a duel. Kazuma is hypnotized by her thighs. Walter declines her request to battle as Darkness berates him for not acting like Kazuma. He admits to originally declining the arranged meeting, but after witnessing her charms, he caught interest. Later, at the training hall, Darkness reveals the absolute depths of her masochism, requesting that Walter continue to defeat her in swordplay. Darkness calls Kazuma to demonstrate his ruthlessness. He accepts, since the marriage is off anyway, and immediately violates the rules of swordplay by drenching her in water. Darkness twitches in euphoria, while Aqua comments on Kazuma's natural inclination towards sexual harassment. The sopping noblewoman urges Kazuma to continue, leading to another display of brutality. Darkness loses all control over her masochism, charging at her opponent like a feral hog. They engage in a grappling contest. Kazuma is at a clear disadvantage, but maniacally unleashes his lich powers, draining Darkness's vitality. She remains unwavering due to the pleasure, overwhelming Kazuma with her unlimited stamina. He responds by striking a deal. The loser must do any one thing, the victor says. She agrees to his terms, falling right into Kazuma's psychological trap. He plants the seeds of what potential heinous things will be done to Darkness, should he win. She instantly loosens her vice grip. Darkness at last succumbs to her perversion, becoming incapacitated from the unseemly bliss. Mr. Dusty walks in on some Something he would have rather not seen, briskly ordering their instant execution. Some time later, Kazuma presumably explained away his charges, and the Lord even remains thankful to him for allowing his precious daughter to live a free life of happiness as darkness awakens. She promptly has filthy delusions, then lies about being pregnant with Kazuma's child. Walther accepts the news with a charming wink and leaves. Dusty experiences an elation he has never felt before. Aqua proceeds to panic as well. When Kazuma's hand barges in with grave news that has to wait until next episode. Monsters are spewing forth from Kiel's hole like never before. Kazuma questions his companions. Megumin doesn't know. Neither does Darkness. Aqua, however, states that there should be less undead because of her. Kazuma is suspicious. She enthusiastically explains how the magic circle used in Kiel's dispelling ritual should be deterring the monsters as well. The party immediately goes to rectify Aqua's mistakes, while some little masked freaks waddle around the entrance. The parole officer determines that the creatures are being produced by a spellcaster 
monster and gives Kazuma a piece of paper to seal the source. Aqua is hugged by one of the midgets. She is violently exploded. Magamin passes on the excursion. Aqua is traumatized, so she passes as well. While traversing the dungeon, Darkness finds that she is able to land hits on the pygmy bombs. She is filled with glorious purpose from the elation of the slaughter. They find some guy crisscrossing in the dirt, fondling his sack. The evil introduces himself as Vanir, commander of the Demon King's armies, Duke of Hell, and an archdemon. Kazuma is shook. Vanir was tasked with finding out information on what happened to Verdia. Kazuma is shook. He reveals that demon can feed off dark emotions of shame for plot reasons. Kazuma becomes aggressive, but is thwarted by Vanir, divulging his secrets. The archdemon monologues about his sublime death wish of being dramatically slain in battle by skilled adventurers, only to reward them with absolutely no loot. His sick perversion leads to an exasperated climax. Van Beer was planning on using this abandoned place as the host to his gravesite, but found a problematic magical circle. He wiggles his pink eye into Kazuma's thoughts, figuring out that it was Aqua who made the spell. Vanir also points out that Darkness and Kazuma are both being pervs about the bet they had last episode. Vanir has nothing against humans, refusing to kill them, but Aqua on the other hand must be punished for the nuisance she has been. Darkness rises to the defense of Aqua as Vanir continues to bring up their filthy bet. The adventure Adventurers are flustered. Darkness becomes violent. Kazuma is tempted by lust. Vanir is agile, deftly evading Darkness's barrage of inaccurate slashes. Kazuma pulls a sneaky, but trips, Rube Goldberging a sick killing move into existence with his luck. Vanir turns into poop, then launches a surprise attack, planting his creepy mask onto Darkness's dome. She is mind controlled by the demon. Darkness is violently aroused by finally being manipulated by a commander of the Demon King's army. Vanir praises her for her willpower, but remains confused by the joy she feels. Meanwhile, Kazuma undoes the magic circle. Vanir finds it difficult to struggle past Darkness's debilitating masochistic debauchery, while unintentionally provoking her further by being naturally evil. Kazuma slaps the ceiling talisman on the mask, trapping Vanir till Aqua can purify him. Vanir fully gains control of her, going to slay Aqua disguised as Darkness. He is immediately struck with a massive burst of radiant energy upon exiting the dungeon. Vanir Vanir tries to introduce himself, but has trouble due to Darkness's vitality. He berates Aqua for not having basic etiquette and is nearly shot again. The police send in the goons, but they are skillfully dispatched. Aqua is afraid as she awaits her final reckoning. Kazuma ideates furiously. He first gets Darkness more aroused to resist Vanir, tells them a fake plan about using steel, then uses a fireball to incinerate the talisman. Despite the seal being gone, Vanir remains firmly attached. Darkness urges both Megalomine and Arthur to unlock load, dramatically offering the demon a deal. Either leave her body and be purified, or go down with her in the blaze of explosion magic. He chooses the latter, admitting to enjoying his final moments. Megumin goes the big boom on our honorable crusader, and the demon residing within. Some time later, Kazuma is released from parole. Darkness was pretty messed up after the explosion, but recovered perfectly, and is now being called Lalatina by her fellow adventurers. Aqua consoles her while she cries from embarrassment. Kazuma and his party are rewarded a whopping 40 million dollars after subtracting his debts. The crowd cheers in celebration. This guy celebrates as well. Kazuma leaves the guild hall a free man. And that's the end of part one of season two of Konosuba. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this dumb video. I have a Patreon if you want to give me money for some reason. Uh, thanks again.